You are listening to the season two finale of Storytime in Paris. For more great content between seasons and to join our book club, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio, where we keep that tradition alive by showcasing an author with a French connection in each episode. Every episode will feature five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. Would you like to join the Storytime in Paris book club? Head on over to patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio and stay tuned to the end of this episode for more information. This episode marks the season finale of season two of Storytime in Paris. I've really loved this season. We've read some wonderful books and the author chats have been very interesting. I have a special treat for you for today's season finale. I'm joined by journalist and best-selling author, Lindsay Tremuda. Lindsay's first book, The New Paris, The People, Places, and Ideas Fueling a Movement, was an Amazon bestseller and named one of the 10 best travel books of 2017 by Smithsonian Magazine. Her latest book, The New Parisienne, The Women and Ideas Shaping Paris, features interviews with a diverse group of influential female activists, artists, feminists, politicians, and more living in Paris. In it, Lindsay explores the jarring difference between the perception of the archetypal Parisian woman and the truth of her actual existence, as well as what it means to be a Parisienne today. In our talk, Lindsay discusses the women she interviewed and the connections she made, intersectionality, the ways in which the U.S. and France are similar, and what it is about Paris that makes it ripe for a revolution. Please allow me to introduce Lindsay Tremuda, author of The New Parisienne, The Women and Ideas Shaping Paris. Hello, Lindsay. Thank you so much for joining me for the season two finale for Storytime in Paris. Oh, thanks for having me. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes. So the short, short short-ish version is I'm a, I work as a journalist and well, author in Paris. I've been here for 16 years and, you know, I came as a as a lover of language, not so much a Francophile necessarily, but you know, I was studying French from the time I was twelve, and so I just realized that I was I was in love with the linguistic aspect of this other culture. So a, a languify languophile languophile yes, I guess maybe we could say that a linguophile anyway. And so that was really my my primary drive. I studied French literature in college and uh, and also linguistics, and and just knew that if I really wanted to take this skill and this, you know, affection for, for the French language to another level, I would need to not live in America. Um, and so, you know, I studied, I studied a couple of times in France and then eventually just stayed. And so what you realize is that you can work in another language, um, and do things that maybe have nothing to do with what you would have done otherwise with a degree in French literature. So I wasn't teaching, I wasn't researching necessarily, and I wasn't a translator or anything, but I was able to, you know, build this life in another language. And 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 that's something that I didn't realize I wanted so much, but proved to be exactly um, what I think I needed also. I write for magazines and newspapers. Uh, sometimes I do some editorial consulting, and then I, you know, I've written two books. One is called The New Paris, and the other, the, the more recent one, is The New Parisienne, and uh, and both really continue what I started to do with my journalism work, which is sort of look at this place and not just Paris, but look at happenings and openings and people through the lens of an evolving place. And so that's sort of the treatment I, I've given my my books because it's it's really trying to say this is this city is so much more than you know we're often presented in in mainstream media or in bo- in most books and and here's why it's compelling in a way that maybe you haven't experienced it before or haven't really you know paid attention to before and that's that's basically uh it in a nutshell <laughs> Yeah, very well said, very succinct. How do you find being a journalist in a second culture? I mean, I guess you've sort of been here since you've been a journalist, but how do you find that being an American affects your being a journalist here in France? 
Well, you know, I actually think it gives a, an English language writer a leg up because as soon as, you know, this is, we're not in like the 1970s or the, even the 90s when, you know, like the character of Carrie Bradshaw from Sex and the City was, you know, supposedly writing a column for media and could make a an incredible living off of that, right? And, and uh, Candace Bushnell, the creator, had said that, you know, because she sort of mirrored that off of, I think, her own life very recently revealed what she was getting paid, you know, for working in that world at the time. And it was like, you know, you could earn up over a hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, we're talking about rates that just don't exist now. So this is not the age when magazine editors are habitually sending journalists from the U S or from the UK, unless they're staffers all over the world. So having people on the ground who are deeply entrenched and conceivably know a great deal about the cultural context and the history and, you know, all that you need to know is a big asset for them. And so I think actually it's been, I mean, obviously there are tremendous ups and downs and COVID, you know, was a huge disruption, but it it's important. And there are, there's so many stories to, to glean from, from this place, whether it's political, from a lifestyle perspective, economic. And so I have found that I the more the longer I'm here and the more I'm sort of gaining knowledge about more topics than you know what I may have started out exploring in my work just means that I I have more to offer and so I think actually it's it's quite a, a gift. Yeah, very interesting. It also sounds like you've got a great curiosity for this sort of thing for these cultural nuances and cultural differences and oh totally I mean definitely more than I'm curious about the U.S. which I think you know when you're when you're I think when you move abroad too and you realize like if you're someone who was always drawn to another place and maybe you didn't feel like you were born in the right place you know that feeling that's sort of just you know very difficult to articulate but you just it's some inner sense that like "Mm, I don't know that I was you know, at one point I, I used to joke that I, I wanted to live in like the environment we, we all saw and read in with little women. And my, my parents were like, <laughs> oh, so you want to live during war and, you know, great uncertainty and when women have very little rights. OK, <laughs> but it was just, you know, it was that was sort of the beginning of feeling like, oh, I don't know that I meant to be in this particular time. And then it became I don't think I'm be- meant to be in this particular place. So so the curiosity really is toward something that was more foreign to me, even though now, you know, I I do feel like the U.S. is extremely foreign to me also. But uh, my curiosity is, I would say my it's not as much curiosity as it is like a horror looking at what's happening, you know, what goes on in the U.S. But here it's more like there are tensions, there are problems. There's a lot of great, wonderful things. And I'm curious about all of it. Very similar for me. I always felt some sort of dissonance in my time in the U.S., but I just sort of assumed I would always be a nomad. Like my family moved around a lot growing up. So I just assumed there wasn't really a place for me. I think that's almost uh, helpful to know that maybe your life is going to be a bit nomadic, you know? Well, yes, but it also lacks some sort of an anchor. Like I I felt like I never really fit in and I just thought I'd always sort of be in this amorphous little bubble. And it wasn't until I moved here that I felt that sense of home that I didn't think existed. So, Hmm. yeah. Well, you know, Paris will either, you know, bring you in and, and suck you, like suck you in forever, or it spits you out and people just can't make it work. So I think when you know it's the right place, you know. Yeah. Or when you sense it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I and I don't still don't know if I'll be here forever, but there's definitely always been this sense of anytime there's come like a visa renewal or whatever, where I just have this this feeling inside, like I, I'm not leaving. Right, right. <laughs> so we're gonna make this work. And you've been here a long time already. Like that's a significant amount of time. And then it, you know, and then it becomes, I'm I'm assuming, a bit harder to imagine where the next place would be. Yeah, or why I would leave. Mm-hmm. How long have you been here? So I think I'm heading into my 16th year. So for me, it's like, no, no, I'm actually someone who needs an anchor. And, uh, and, and I don't ever foresee myself being very nomadic. I think it's actually kind of interesting that I'm, I, I left because my parents recall me having a lot of separation anxiety as a kid, um, even needing a bit of urging to study abroad because I was just like, oh my God, what am I going to miss back at home? And people were like, are you nuts? 
think about the people that would rather be spending time in Europe or, you know, and then once I was there, it was like, oh, okay, life transformation has begun. But there is this, I don't know, I think either you're someone who grew up moving around a lot. And so it's it's sort of natural. Um, but for me, it was very much a, a blossoming that happened. And I, I definitely needed the urging. So I, I can't foresee myself leaving France, although maybe one day we would leave Paris. But um, that also seems like such an inconceivable idea. But you know, it's it's a stre- it can be a stressful place, as you know, like loud and, you know, sometimes just the energy can be draining. Yeah, it can be a bit hostile. Yeah. <laughs> hostile is a bit hard. <laughs> yeah, it could just feel like you're banging your head against a wall that doesn't need to be there. But anyway, I digress. Let's talk about your book. So I've gathered some questions for you. Sure. The first one is this. How did you go about finding the new Parisiennes that you featured? And what lessons can you share about the connections that you made in writing this book? Oh, so these women were, it was, it was such a difficult task, actually, because obviously there were women who I hadn't yet, I knew I, I hadn't met. And I, I knew that in, invariably they would appear when it was too late, you know? Like just that, you know, you haven't yet met all the people who are super inspiring and who could be, you know, perfect for this sort of a uh, a project. But, you know, I had to just sort of say, OK, it's it's now publishing is the way it is. It's, you know, eventually there's a cutoff point. You have to just make your selection. So I started with women I had either interviewed or come across during my journalism work and who I thought were spectacular or fascinating women who I was actively following on Twitter also, because, you know, a lot of these women are very vocal and had had very firm uh strong points of view on 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 Paris and on life. I also looked at my own sort of extended circle of of individuals who maybe I had met, maybe we were we had a a budding friendship and and it really allowed me to get closer to them. And then a couple of women would make suggestions, but ultimately I tried to come up with a a sample that would highlight a variety of careers, a variety of backgrounds, you know, these are not necessarily women who are French born. And those who are, um, I think the majority are either from outside of Paris, the suburbs, or even further afield. Like, I think there was maybe one woman who was actually born in Paris. So, I mean, that sends a certain message as well. But really to say we need to expand our understanding of what it means to be a woman in this city and and really step away as much as possible from this whitewashing that happens constantly with this city. So my connection to them, I mean... Some of them I've become quite close with. Some obviously are are just too busy slash too like I obviously I don't have a friendship with Anne Hidalgo. Like that. <laughs> that's not a thing. But it makes me more curious to follow their evolution from here and to see sort of how my own opinion changes on their work. Or, you know, obviously that wasn't the point. The point wasn't to say like I'm unabashedly aligned with every single thing that these women do but it's really trying to say that you know these are the, these are stories these are real stories these are women who in many cases overcame a lot of adversity or you know economic difficulty growing up you know or just needed to leave their country and and that i think has completely changed the way i look at paris as a home for everyone really for everyone who wasn't born here and how I look at just women's stories and, and realizing how, how this place manages to be a magnet still to this day for people who know it's an imperfect place, but still has so much to offer that it's worth, you know, uprooting yourself. And maybe that's not always voluntary, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the place to create a life for yourself. Um, and so I just find that super powerful. And I, I go back to that in my mind quite a bit. Does French culture sometimes leave you scratching your head? Well, you might enjoy listening to our sister podcast, Navigating the French, hosted by journalist Emily Monaco. Each episode focuses on a different word in the French language, and Emily is joined by an expert who will help explore what that word says about French culture. Listen now to Navigating the French on ParisUndergroundRadio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to story time in Paris. One of the things that you talk about a lot in the book is this concept of intersectionality. 
Mm. Can you explain what that is and why it's so important and maybe difficult to add into the French conversation? So it's actually a feminist movement that began in the U.S. and was coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a, actually a, you know, a lawyer, an activist. And it really was simply to say that you know, the, the fight for women is not equal everywhere. We need to stop pretending or assuming or, or suggesting that every action we take to improve the lives and rights of women are across the board the same because by nature of one's sexuality, religion, health, race, you know, all of these things, they go through life with other oppressions as well. And so you cannot suggest there's a one size fits all to, to handling this. And so that movement obviously became quite powerful in the US and, and then it is rising. I mean, I would say it's perhaps it's not the dominant feminist theory in France because there's still this very white feminist approach, uh, which again, tries to to say, you know, oh, women who would wear the veil or the headscarf need to be saved. You know, that that savior complex is very present. But but there are enough women now very vocal who believe that, you know, no one, no governmental structure, no organization has properly taken into account all of the other oppressions that some women might face. So so that really is the thread that runs through a lot of the women's perspectives in the book. I, not all of them, but but even those who don't perhaps necessarily adhere to a fully intersectional vision of you know of life for for women agree that there needs to be much greater inclusivity in in work in life in in the public sphere and just a better i would say understanding that women can make their own choices <laughs> i know i know it seems it's like we roll our eyes and we're like really we're still here but you see how quickly we can all regress and america is a good example of that so it's tricky though you as for your second the second part of your question because you know certainly with universalist values and for those who don't fully you know know what what that means in the french context is that you know the french look at every citizen as being or on paper they are equal under the republic and there's they're colorblind and you know whether you're from mali the us germany uh if you're a french citizen or you're living in france you are French first, except that that does not actually play out the way it is written. And it's a wonderful ideal to strive for, but it's just not working. And so same thing with women. It's, you know, when you're trying to say, let's celebrate differences and be very conscious of differences because it, you know, it changes the way we need to develop policies and, you know, address discrimination. It makes it very challenging. Also, France does not collect ethnic data which makes it very difficult to measure the discriminations that exist. And, you know, you understand where this comes from, obviously, you know, collaborationist, you know, Vichy, France, war with the Nazis, like you get, you under, you can understand why there, there's this reluctance to want to make these kinds of reports, but it also has its limitations. So it's, you're, you're dealing with a context that is not necessarily like an embrace of multiculturalism in the way that you might find it in the US or in, in the UK. And that seemed as sort of like, well, no, you should be French first. So gathering with groups who have similar experiences, whether that's, you know, Black Africans or, or, or Black French individuals who feel that they've been victims of racism, them sort of rallying together, the LGBTQ community rallying together. In some ways, the French look at that as being uh, what they would call communitariste. So, you know, sort of almost sectarian and being dangerous, a threat to, you know, universalist values. So it makes the, com the, the context quite challenging because you have these two sides. And it, it's sort of like the people who will defend certain elements of the Constitution without uh, the U.S. Constitution, without sort of accepting that there are nuances and it, things evolve and that, you know, these values were set up long ago. I kind of compare it to that, where there's this rigidity in interpretation. Yeah, it's a nice concept that we're all equal, but we know that we don't all start in the same place. We don't all end in the same place. And one of the things that's universally understood, I think, that you talk about in your book is this whitewashed idea of what a Parisian is, mm. specifically a Parisian woman. Like we, If I say that, you picture something in your head, and I'm sure that we are all, like 99% of us, picturing the same woman. Or a variation of her, yeah. Yeah, so we're like putting blinders onto the fact that there are these differences between us that can actually 
enrich what it means to be a Parisian and the actual truth of what it is to be a Parisian. Yeah. And I mean, look at New York. I mean, that's a city that is made up with people from everywhere. And at a certain point, they do call themselves New Yorkers, right? Like, oh, well, I'm from Michigan, but I've lived in New York. And they go back to New York, you know, if they had a, obviously a, a positive experience, but like, that's something that you don't always hear people say in in Paris. And and I think that has to do with this difficulty of assuming, uh, not assuming, uh, that's the French way of saying it, of of uh, imposing oneself there and, and saying like, no, this is this is my city and I am a Parisian because I've made my life here and it doesn't matter that I wasn't born here. Did you have any preconceptions when you were outlining this book that changed through its writing and your interviews? I think I assumed that some of the um, some of the women would be more critical actually of of Paris and I think it was really Paris is this creative hub Paris is this the place that gives them energy and an inspiration and it's sort of the broader context of of the country that they struggle with right so Paris isn't necessarily the problem Paris is perhaps where there's the most possibility for change and I guess I was just sort of expecting them to be, because they're critical on certain policies and, and, and aspects of life, that they would also be critical of the city. But in fact, most of them seem to treat it as a safe haven. Hmm. C- certainly with, you know, obviously there are problems and we've had a rough six years there, right? You know, terrorist attacks and and, and this and that. But But overall, they look at that as being, a place where they can build the fight. Those who are, are fighting something. Others are just trying to, you know, build a career, build a life. And, and that's, that's the place where they can do it. Very interesting. I want to ask you about uh, the response that you've gotten for the new Parisian. And now that your book has been translated into French, has there been a different reception from your French readers? What I found fascinating was how receptive, well, first of all, English language readers were of it. And I think they struggle. Many of them would say, well, there were two two common uh, pieces of feedback. One was, you know, oh gosh, I'm so guilty of falling for the, the myth, you know, and, you know, rationally as someone who's educated and, and loves to read and thinks about life very profoundly, like, I can't believe that I, you know, didn't challenge these ideas. And then the other side were people who are of, you know, either people of color or people who felt maybe some level of discrimination in, in, in Paris. And maybe they were also French people, but who read the, uh, the English version first and were just like, finally a different version of the story. And, and, you know, were very appreciative to see themselves reflected in some way. And that's exactly why I I thought it was important. When the French version came out, similarly, I think people were like, Oh, okay, an a, a you know semi outsider to a degree, right? Because I wasn't born here is is commenting on this. But there were some people who you know have a visceral reaction to some of the women in in the book, um, including well Hidalgo, of course, um, because she's a polarizing figure. But also Roque Yadiello, who's the journalist uh, anti racist activist, who's I mean, f- several times a week she's on uh on tv on these as a panelist and she's a commentator and she writes opinion pieces even for the washington post and you know as i as i write in her profile she is vilified for for shining a light on on the ills in in society and you know they they assume that basically she is saying the country's terrible and you know well if you're that unhappy of course the whole rhetoric of like you know well then go home so okay well this is my home and <laughs> What I remember and what I would say to people who would say like, oh, oh you know, you included a okay, yeah. you know, they, they find her radical, which I do not at all. But I would say, you know, she is someone who who thinks and feels very strongly that France can do better and, you know, is a great country that needs to, you know, to sort of assume its its great potential needs to really grapple with some of these issues and its and its past. And so, you know, I think it's because she's so dedicated to that mission that you know, yeah, you criticize the place you love. James Baldwin did the same thing. You know, a lot of the the, the world's greatest intellectuals criticized their home country because they wanted so badly for it to do better. And so, but but that sometimes will, people will make assumptions about the book before really reading it or seeing the other women involved because they'll see a few women that they're like, 
ah, mais non. You know, oh, it's too radical. It's going to be super lefty, you know, and, and really the idea is saying that, you know, there's my, my opinion that's sort of laid out to a degree in the beginning, but it's, it's more about the myth of the Parisian more than anything. And then anything political comes through the women and not all of them share those kinds of views. And, and while it might be subtle, there are some women who, you know, make comments that, you know, are not aligned with some other women's comments in the book. And so you can, you know, but you have to read it to, to, to glean that. So, you know, whatever, we all make assumptions, right? It's, it's like if you put Hillary Clinton in a book uh, and people who just cannot tolerate her might turn away from it. But, but the reception was great. I think I had a lot of support from, you know, platforms like My Little, My Little Paris and, and Mona, which is sort of a female focused collective within My Little Paris from, you know, journalists who, who also see what's happened and they don't want their women to be misrepresented, you know? So I, I think that the people on the platforms that matter most were very warm and receptive to it. So I can't complain. I've met a lot of wonderful people through this experience, readers who have come out and, and for the first time, maybe they followed me for years, but finally could like read something because my first book was not translated. So, you know, this was sort of a, a, an opportunity for them to engage with me in a different way. And I'm so grateful for that. What about men? Are men reading this book? Yes. So I'm sure probably not in the numbers that, that uh, you know, of women readers, but um, some of my earliest feedback came from men. And one, one, a French guy who messaged me to say he read it in English with his girlfriend, who was also French, and that he was, it like opened his eyes to so many issues he hadn't really thought of in that way. Another man who I, I believe like he follows me on Twitter as well. And he speaks perfect English. So, you know, I think, I believe he read the English version, but was so, what, what's the word laudatory or just so uh, appreciative of the, the messages. And, and that meant the world to me. Right. I mean, the fact that men, men need to be part of this, men need to be part of solving representation issues and solving or solving or, or just, addressing the problems of, of portraying women in this way. And so that to me is a, is a big win Yeah, that, you know, that the, the kind of men that I think were certainly already inclined to, you know, support feminist ideas and, and movements. I mean, but, but you read anything about what feminists really want and they want men to be part of this fight because they have to, it's the only way. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you have to adapt any part of this book for the French translation? That's such a good question. Yeah, no, we. I think probably I adjusted a bit only to to say like these are the themes that come up, but obviously some of them will know more, and so I think we did sort of take out anything that was overly explanatory, and we were, we had an opportunity to update, right? So some of the figures we were able to update the fact that PMA, which was the medically assisted procreation, that I believe you know, when I wrote the English manuscript, it still hadn't passed. So we were able to, it's, a, it's kind of a wonderful opportunity to make sure that, you know, if things changed in that short time, then we can really include it. You know, but other than that, I don't really think, the only thing I can think of was something involving one of the women who talked about how she didn't believe in having a nanny or, or much or like a babysitter for her kids. She runs a restaurant with her husband. And so they would pick, they would, they would race out of the restaurant to pick the kids up from school because she wanted them to know what her parents did and be part of this community that the restaurant developed. And, and I think in the English version, it didn't strike me as being overly critical or negative, but I think my translator, Kahin, thought that there was something a bit too disparaging mm. in the way it was, in the way it was expressed toward women who do sort of resort to, to help quite quickly. I think the, the idea was she was saying like, until my kids are older, like I didn't want them to just, I didn't want to just ship them off with someone at the age of two or three. And it could seem like she was criticizing those who made that choice, but really, so I think we may have softened the, just to make sure it didn't sound, you know, overly aggressive. Because the English didn't, but in French, if you were to translate it sort of exactly, it did sound a little bit more harsh. But I thought I thought I thought it was an interesting exercise because obviously the idea is not to say like you shouldn't say this, but really to say this is how it's coming across in French. Are you sure that's what she truly meant? Yeah. 
So to honor her actual meaning. Yes, totally. Are you searching for spiritual guidance? The Heart of You podcast is an exploration into your soul through intuition, spirituality, divination, and unconditional love. Host Annette Lu is a spiritual guidance coach, intuitive, Akashic, and tarot reader who discusses practical ways to integrate spiritual growth into your everyday life. Listen now to The Heart of You on ParisUndergroundRadio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to story time in Paris. So I want to ask you a version of the question that you ask many of your interviewees. Do you think that Paris can become a center for a more vocal rebellion against the systems in place that are exploiting to women? Oh, good question. (laughs) It's yours. (laughs) I do. Yeah, but you phrased it differently and perfectly. So no, I I do. I do. I, I, I honestly think that in all the years I've been here, and I'd be curious to know if you feel the same. There is a really intense level of engagement of from people who wouldn't wouldn't necessarily call themselves activists, you know. Already Parisians are, you know, and in other cities too, are are are, you know, protesting and demonstrating as part of their sort of DNA, but it's reached a new a new point in the last, I don't know, five years. And certainly during COVID, we felt it in the summer of 2020 with the anti-racist movement. We feel it now very heavily. When it comes to women gathering, and there are organizations like Nutut and La Fondation des Femmes, which really encourage women to get out into the streets, and you know, and you see men in the streets for those causes as well. And and given the political situation, it's sort of empowering more and more of these groups to stand up. Because if we can't necessarily, if we're always trying to just avoid having the far right in politics, then they need to be super powerful in their social justice planning and and voting for legislative elections to change things in other ways and so i i think paris is is really shaping that conversation and showing politicians particularly macron that you cannot get away with going against your promises or 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 ignoring certain issues because it will come to bite you and we will bite you <laughs> So I do think I do think this is still um, one of the best places. I think Marseille is another, very different, obviously, but I think there's something powerful that has historically happened here and continues to happen here. And uh, social media, as as treacherous and and life sucking as it can be, has been a real way for people who were not so civically engaged to feel part of this movement and they can do it in ways that are still within their comfort zones. And I think that's, that's been a great tool. Yeah. I think that there's, there's something resistant. Well, I mean, there's lots of resistant things. In the world, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that they, you know, there are certain French people who don't like calling themselves activists or feminists or right. whatever it is that they have hangups about the words, but there's something in their DNA that makes them revolutionaries that makes them want to protest and strike. And so they it feels like those movements are happening anyway and vocally, even if the people in the movements aren't calling themselves by those names. Exactly. That's exactly what I feel. And I feel like that's just gotten stronger. Yeah. Perhaps because, you know, our access to information about everything that goes on is, is you know, so limitless. But I do think there's something naturally, the French naturally question in a way that the that Americans I think are maybe starting to do some of them uh but that is like a that's the way they're raised and uh and I think that that is hopefully something that will continue to serve them well as we move into this sort of unknown territory politically economically socially and you know I'm all here for that I think that's as 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 you said that I think I realized that's maybe what you know draws me to to people here because there is this like they they don't just sit sit back and accept and even when they I'm not and this is not a positive but even the people who are you know might lean toward conspiratorial thinking they're at least doing the challenging of things that they they just aren't sure and so they're they're prepared to challenge I'm not saying that's ultimately a good thing in you know depending on what they believe but there is this sort of natural um, as you said, resistance to just accepting something at face value. Yeah. 
there's this like inherent questioning. Mm. And it's interesting too, because in the U S we're raised to question everything. And yet I feel like a lot of people don't. And I think maybe being here and watching what's happening in America and seeing things come to a head and seeing, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement there has helped open the floodgates here. Mm -hmm. And whereas in the US, there's maybe a tendency to try to close those doors afterwards. Yep. I don't feel like that happens here so much. Like once the doors are open, they're open. I, I would agree with that. And I also think um, as much as we may be told to, you know, seek out different perspectives and voices, uh, in, in the U S at the same time, you're sort of told this is what America is. It's great. And that's what I find very troubling. Although I think also in France, you know, they don't teach the, colo the, the colonial history remotely uh, sufficiently. Um, yeah. And, and so in that sense, there's this <laughs> actually quite a similarity in terms of the feelings of grandeur, but, but I only felt like I really understood that America was not the way it was portrayed to us in the last, basically since Trump. So, yeah. you know, and that's when all of, I think everyone started unraveling the layers and like, okay, maybe you didn't read all this literature that existed on all the problems before, but like do it now because yeah. it's there and this is not unprecedented. So now's the time to sort of, come to terms with your understanding about America's role in the world and its history and its ills and its, and, and, and its greatness too, in some ways, but, but not, you know, it is not the land of opportunity uh, that, uh, that we've all grown up. Well, not all of us, but that we're sort of beaten over the head with the idea that it's, it's a land for opportunity for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. So So this is a passage from the cultural primer that I provide in the beginning of the book, particularly about feminism, because Jennifer asked me about intersectionality, and I thought it was worth going a little bit deeper and understanding sort of what feminism in France was, what it is becoming, mostly because this is a theme that is recurring in a lot of the profiles and conversations with the women featured in the book. So if you do have the book, this begins on page 27. Feminism in France has evolved considerably since Simone de Beauvoir published The Second Sex. Many of the feminist activists in this book have made it clear that the word alone, slowly but surely, is shaking off its taboo. Still, feminists find themselves having to reiterate that feminism is not about gender wars, but about a social movement fighting for equality and against sexist oppression. And they're doing so in a variety of ways. Today, there are as many interpretations of feminism as there are women, with micro-movements within that fight for equality. Clear distinctions in ideology, however, can be made. When it comes to the self-identified feminists in this book, they generally adhere to an intersectional approach. While they are among the most vocal, they know they have yet to tip the balance and become the majority. French feminism has long had a reputation for universalism and gender essentialism, and therefore has been generally aligned with patriarchal ideology. Its most prominent figures have been white, bourgeois, cisgendered, and able-bodied, able-bodied, and share the opinion that the fight is more or less the same for all women. In the eyes of feminist fashion journalist and author Alice Pfeiffer, the particularity of these French feminists is that they are more interested in speaking for their privileged class and maintaining their positions within it than speaking for their entire gender. As she puts it, the dominant contingent is, quote, against the headscarf, pro-sex in a way that seems apologetic to male sexuality, anti-pornography and prostitution, believes that dressing sexy is a sign of gender betrayal, and that feminism should have limits. This, of course, makes you think of the 2018 Catherine Deneuve and Catherine Millet signed manifesto in Le Monde, denouncing Me Too and defending une liberté d'importuné, indispensable à la liberté sexuelle, how men should have the freedom to bother, a concept indispensable to sexual freedom, in other words, a man's right to seduce. The philosophy, or this philosophy, is perhaps best represented by Elisabeth Badinter, among the country's most widely known universalist feminists and intellectuals, and the most mainstream insofar as her books, often controversial on the culture of motherhood and women's independence, have been national bestsellers. 
The causes she has championed over the years have also been subject to controversy, particularly her public support for the 2005 headscarf ban and the 2011 burqa law, as she believes these dress codes are oppressive largely because they are, quote, traditional. In an open letter to Muslim women at the time of the vote, Badinter wrote, I believe that what's good for me, liberty, is good for you. Which is another way of saying the traditions of other cultures are necessarily an impediment to women's freedoms and therefore this must be done to protect them. The emerging generation of feminist voices, some of whom whom you will meet in these pages, insists that it's not about wearing the headscarf or opting not to, rejecting cosmetics or adornment, losing weight or gaining it, surgically transforming our bodies or leaving them be, having five kids or five cats, pursuing a career or staying home to raise children. It's about having the freedom to choose without judgment. They are adamant that intersectionality, a theory developed in the United States in the late 1980s by civil rights advocate and scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, that only found a footing in France in the last few years, is the only way forward. In feminism, intersectionality suggests that the fight for equality isn't created equal by nature of the disadvantages and inequalities that many non-white, non-binary women face. These oppressions take different forms and often compound themselves, as does a person's ability to resist and navigate them, but are largely based on constraints that attend one's class, race, sexual orientation, nationality, and religion. Recognizing and understanding these different dimensions, says Rebecca Amsalem, one of the women featured in the book, is an act of solidarity. Fabulous. Well, so what is next for you? Do you have another book in the works? I have a, a proposal in the works. Uh, nothing nothing has happened um, yet. So, I mean, I would love to be able to do this project that I, I can't really elaborate on, but um, I would love to be able to do it and would really extend my focus, you know, beyond just France. But, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to the stories of, of individuals shaping Paris. I think that's so important. And um, as much as I can, you know, speaking to students, students also are sort of like at this prime spot in their development to naturally challenge things, of course, especially college students. Um, but, you know, so many still study in France. And if I can, if, you know, I can dialogue with them, not only about the benefits of living outside of their home country, but about, you know, political and representation issues in in France, I feel like, you know, it can, it can lead to something positive. So I really like the idea of dialoguing. And so through everything I'm doing, I'm trying to continue that focus essentially. And where can people find you to hear this dialogue? Oh gosh, probably in too many places, right? Aren't we on a a (laughs) zillion platforms? Um, well, I, I have a, a podcast called the New Paris Podcast. So there are other conversations with men and women uh, on various themes. Uh, on Instagram, you can well, my, my handle is still currently lost in Cheeseland, but that will probably change to Lindsay Tremuda soon. Also on Twitter, Lindsay Tremuda. Um, and if you want to sign up for my newsletter where I send sort of updates and things happening, and um, you can visit lindsaytremuda.com. And there's a sign up link there. But But otherwise, just Google my name and I'm sure a bunch of stuff will will come up that I'm not aware of. (laughs) (laughs) Fabulous. And I'll include links to all of that so that people can find you really easily. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Lindsay. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me on Storytime. (laughs) Thank you again to Lindsay Tremuda for such an interesting conversation. You can find Lindsay on her website, lindsaytremuda.com on socials at Lindsay Tremuda and at Lost in Cheeseland. Thank you for listening to the season two finale of Storytime in Paris. I hope you've enjoyed the season as much as I have. If you'd like to keep the conversation going between seasons, please join me on Patreon. For as little as five euros a month, you'll get great behind the scenes content and more insights into life in Paris. If you'd like to take a deeper dive into the books featured on this podcast, join our book club, also on Patreon. Each month we'll be joined via Zoom by an author I've interviewed on this podcast to learn even more about them and their work. Our next featured author is Lillian Milgram, author of L'Origine, the world's most erotic masterpiece. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity, and you can find me on all socials at Jennyphoria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. And on my website, Jennyphoria.com. Storytime in Paris is produced by me as part of the Paris Underground Radio Podcast Network. To check out interviews with previous guests or to discover more great Paris-based podcasts, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. 
Thank you for listening, and I'll see you in season three. This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.